Hollywood is being rebuilt by artists not afraid to disrupt the status quo, telling fresh stories and bringing to life characters who until now have been confined to the margins. This is Emerging Hollywood. I'm here with Jamila Jamil, because she's one of the stars of The Good Place, who's all about empowering positive body image and who isn't afraid to use her platform to call out destructive standards of beauty. What was the perfect body to you originally? When I was younger, I thought you weren't worth anything no matter what you'd achieved in your life unless you had jutting hip bones. So that's what I thought the perfect I don't know what the body. Hell that is. That's a jutting hip. That's like when you're so thin that your hip bone is sticking out of your trousers. Oh. The look in the 90s, you know, when like Kate Moss was saying, nothing tastes as good as thin feels. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you eating pizza? I think I was a very young kid when I first realized that there was an oppressive beauty standard on me. Also, it was very white, and mm -hmm. I never used to see brown or black people really in my magazines or on my television. So at seven, did you rebel against it or did you want to embrace it? Did you know from the beginning, like, this isn't normal? I didn't really like fully understand my shame. I just knew that I, I felt embarrassed about having a little seven-year-old tummy, which is like a completely normal thing to have. Yeah. And I was growing really tall, so I was going out before I would go up. And uh, by the time I was about 11 or 12, I had very, very bad body shame because I wanted to look like all of the anorexic models in my magazines. And I um, was fully anorexic by the time I was about 13. I wasn't menstruating. Like, my body was sort of letting me know that I was dying from the inside. And uh, it's because I got hit by a car at 17 into another car and broke a part of my back that I was able to have some sense literally knocked into me that I stopped starving myself. Where were the parents at and the grandparents saying, eat, girl? Anorexics are very, very skilled and secretive and it's often very bright kids who are able to be successful at anorexia. So, you gotcha. know, you just sort of, you lie a lot and you wear baggy clothes and, and no one can explicitly see your bones. You're not walking around naked with all your bones out all the time. Uh, you're able to keep it hidden and, you know, there's a lot of stress from school. So I think parents just don't really know. And also parents, especially back then, weren't educated about eating disorders. The eating disorder numbers are the highest they've ever been, the self-harm are the highest numbers they've ever been, the highest teen suicide in the world. We're in chaos. What, what about the car accident made you realize, like, yo, I gotta, I gotta wake up? Well, I was now, like, completely physically disabled and couldn't use my body and realized that, wow, this body was, was doing so much for me all along and I was just starving and actively, actively hurting it and trying to kill it all the time. And I took it so badly for granted. I felt great shame about that once I no longer had autonomy over myself. I was very sad to see what I'd done and how I'd wasted the last couple of years of my life. And so I stopped starving myself and became healthier in what I would put into my body. But I still had an anorexic mentality that went on until I was maybe about 28, 29 years old. You had a cancer scare at one point too, right? Yeah, that's why I moved to America and became an actor. I had a lump in my breast and a doctor found it. And they make you wait a week to find out if it's cancer or not. And so I made a bucket list, which I actually call a fuck it list, oh, of everything I would do if I found out I didn't have cancer. Yeah. And the number one thing on that list was move to America. And so six weeks to the day from the operation, you could fly. So six weeks to the day from the operation, I booked a one-way ticket to Los Angeles with no visa, no contacts, no friends in America, with no plan. How'd you get into the media game? I was an English teacher at the same school that Russell really? Brand was an English teacher. So yeah, I think there must be it. something in the water there. Mm. <laughs> um, Russell Brand was an English teacher? I know. What the hell did I know that? I don't know. He's, wow. I mean, he's done a lot of other things of note, uh, so it's maybe fallen <laughs> by the wayside, but we were both English teachers at the same school, and I was in a pub, the pub that we go to at the end of every week, called The Green Man, and a producer walked up to me, and we started talking. He thought I was funny. There was this open call for this huge job to replace this TV host at the time called Alexa Chung, and uh, it was a nationwide call, and I was like, oh, no, I think show business is dumb, and I think the people in show business are dumb. Um, and then he said it was a 1,000 pounds a day, and I was like, sorry, what was that you mean? <laughs> uh, and I went for the job and got it, and I have been a TV host and a radio DJ and a writer, and now an actress ever since. It seems like you're a public servant, so I can see you being a teacher. And I can also see why maybe the industry doesn't fulfill you as much, so you have to do the activism mm -hmm. and you know, the empowerment of other people? It's a dirty industry. I'd yeah. feel a bit dirty in it if I wasn't doing something to undo some of the damage that it does. There's also great parts of this industry, uh, and I think entertainment is such a beautiful and important thing to do that I've been on the receiving end of how much it can save your life when you're down. But also the entertainment industry has some rotten parts of it that we're trying to slowly lift out. And 
I can't be part of it. I have to do something to rally against it. Otherwise, I feel like I'm a traitor to women and to young people. What does it mean to be a feminist? Feminist just means wanting equal rights for men and women. I don't think it means a, a battle of superiority. For me, uh, I want feminism to mean that I am an ally to all women, and that includes trans women. And I think I've learned over the last year from black women how much black women are left out of feminism, and that has taught me that I need to step up and do more to make sure that my feminism is more intersectional. Mm -hmm. And so I think feminism just means fighting for the rights of equality for all women. What are the misconceptions of feminism? That you're a feminazi, I think is the term, and that you hate men and you don't want men to be your allies. We do want men to be our allies. We literally need men to be our allies. If you look back through history, uh, in every case of oppression, the oppressed, however much they fight to get the attention of the oppressor, they rely upon the mercy of the oppressor. And so I, my feminism is very inclusive of men and is not at all like attacking of men. I call men out when they need to be called out, but I very much so want friends and allies in this because I think it would benefit men and women to have us all be equals. And I think some feminism can sometimes be understandably aggressive and angry towards men, but in a way that sometimes makes men so defensive and shuts them out. And I think woke bashing and cancel culture is super dangerous because it devalues progress. Mm -hmm. It's saying that if you ever made a mistake or you ever thought the wrong thing or you ever weren't woke or you've made a mistake now that you've said sorry for and you're actively changing your ways, it doesn't matter because once you've committed any sin, you're done and you're out forever. I don't think that's helpful because then people are just going to stop bothering to learn yeah. if they think that there's no, there's no value in that. The male ego is very, very fragile. Yeah, but I think we could also teach maybe men that rejection isn't so bad. Yeah. And we could teach women to be kind in rejection. Like little girls and little boys, I think we've messed up rejection and stigmatized it. I also feel like we should tell men that like uh, no is no, and like a woman doesn't have to give a reason for that no. Like you shouldn't have to say, oh, I got a boyfriend. Uh, I know I shouldn't you know? have to, but like I endanger my life when I don't have an excuse. It's hyper normalized to us to just have to protect your life from the second you wake up. Something has to stop. Time isn't up. I mean, time is up, but mm -hmm. we need to keep that going. It can't just be a fashion statement. Yeah, I don't think time is up. I think we're aware of the time, though, which yeah. is good. You know what I mean? I think that's mm -hmm. what the Time's Up and Me Too movement did. It made men aware of some of the toxic behavior that they could have been doing. I saw you call out uh, Khloe Kardashian, Iggy Azalea, Cardi B, and Amber Rose for promoting flat tummy tees. Why was that? They're selling products that they aren't announcing the side effects of on their posts. They're selling products with... Uh, I mean, bold claims of abilities with weight loss and aesthetic differences. They are attributing their aesthetic that is down to a trainer, a chef, a dietitian, Photoshop and surgery to a powder that you buy over the internet. They don't drink them. I don't even know if these people really take these products. They definitely can't know what's in them because you would never recommend that to a 13 year old. So how do we like, you know, how do you cancel things that you don't need but keep that person? I think there's a difference. I don't cancel the Kardashians or Iggy Azalea or Cardi B, I'm not canceling them, I'm mm -hmm. reprimanding them. It's fine to call someone out because yeah. you're, you're offering them the opportunity of changing and doing better. What are your thoughts on plastic surgery? Each to their own. I think you can have plastic surgery, but if you are in the public eye, you have to own up to it. Mm -hmm. Do not dare have plastic surgery and alter your appearance or Photoshop your images without announcing it because then you are forcing other people to try to live up to an expectation that you yourself are not able to attain. I'm aware that some people find me annoying and a bit relentless, but until shame takes a day off and until this dangerous behavior takes a day off, I won't. I, I think that you are who you say you are, but do you think that uh, being overly woke is being used as like a selling point now for certain people? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a lot of like, I understand the fear of performative wokeness, but I actually don't think I'm that woke and I actually refer to myself only ever as a feminist in progress because I'm not woke. Performative wokeness, I gotta write that one down. Yeah, performative wokeness where, you know, now we're sort of like, you know, the hashtag empower spawn and everyone's trying to use human rights as a way to sell themselves or sell a product. I think that's gross. I mean, there's so much stress that we are all under. We all just need therapy. We all need to Damn be given right. a break. And uh, we all need to be proud of ourselves. I have been a very disenfranchised person who's been very demoralized by the world around me. And I'm just trying to fix it before I bring a child into the world. So I completely understand if, if people distrust me. I look like the enemy, I'm slim, I fit within society's like conventional attractiveness and I am an actress in Hollywood. Why would anyone trust me? But you're just gonna have to wait and see what I do. 
and that's really up to you if you believe in me. I'm not going to stop because people doubt me and most people support me. In the future, what changes do you think are most pertinent for the industry to make when it comes to portrayal of women? I think we need more and more diversity and that doesn't just mean different thin women in different colours. Um, it would also be great to have some more South Asians because really until recently we've had white people browning up and playing us. Yeah. Or if we do get the role, we're blowing up white people or we are talking very similar type of stereotype and we're very loud and yeah. we're saying very silly thing all the time. And we're never the love interest, we're never the sex symbol. We're just always the ridiculous awful and embarrassing sort of stereotype. And I think it'd be really cool for more people like Mike Scher to create roles for us, or to have some South Asian creators mm -hmm. to create authentic roles for us so that it's not just like me, Kamail, and Mindy, and Priyanka. Yeah, I always wonder if those uh, industries can blow up in America though, only because the population is so small when it comes to like that group of people. I don't think that's true, especially not in England, where the population's mm -hmm. massive of our people. Well, I mean, I'm like, saying here in America. Them, but yeah, here in yeah. America. No, I think there's still, there's enough for them to be represented. Definitely there's enough. We're not talking about 10 or 12 people. There's still a large and ever-growing population. And also, the products that are made in America and in Hollywood go out across the world. Like, mm -hmm. we're, you're educating and nourishing and entertaining the world, but you have to be more responsible. And our world is becoming increasingly beige because everyone is shagging everyone from all kinds of different places. That is a fact. And there is no more, I mean, it's just everyone's mixed. What's next for Jamila? I don't have a plan. I think the key to my success has been being open to whatever comes in via my periphery. And so I'm just open to whatever comes. Yeah. I have a community called I Weigh, which is nothing to do with weight. It's just called I Weigh because it's changing the way in which we value women. We, we no longer want women or men or anyone to be valued by a measuring scale, by a weighing scale. I weigh, for example, my career, my financial independence, my activism, my lovely relationship, my wonderful friends, my sit-down chat with Charlemagne. Mm -hmm. uh, like these are the things that contribute to who I am, as well as all the things that I've struggled with and overcome in my life. I'm turning I weigh into a company, into a, a lifestyle company, um, that's actually about your actual lifestyle. It's about being smarter and happier, not thinner and younger. I'll continue with my activism, and maybe people will continue to hire me for acting roles. So what are your guidelines when choosing projects? My guidelines when choosing projects are I don't want to do nudity, and I don't pick parts which I think are uninteresting or a cliche about women. So mm. I'm not just going to play like the nagging, annoying girlfriend. I want a role that's actually challenging and nuanced. Uh, what I love about the good place is that you have two women who have uh, very complicated existences and a very complicated relationship with each other. Nothing about them is a cliche. And I think that's really cool. And I think we just need more of that rather than the same old stereotypes that have been used to pigeonhole women. You think you write your own show? Yes. I'd really like to write my own show. I have a couple of different ideas that I have just with interesting diverse cast, people of different sizes, people of different backgrounds. And again, The Good Place, it, you don't get more diverse in so many ways than on that set. It's just, it's really cool to be a part of it and none of us are tokenized. Yeah, I feel like when you want to tell the stories that you want to see, you have to write them. Like who Often, else is gonna yeah. do that? You said something interesting though, you talked about, you say none of y'all are tokens. Like I don't want token diversity either, mm -hmm. where they're just putting certain people in certain places just to say that they're there. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. I also feel very passionately about not taking disabled roles. I was asked recently to play maybe the part of a deaf woman, and I said, uh, I was literally asked to play the role of a deaf woman, and I said no, even though I was deaf as a child until I was about 12 on and off. I had lots of operations, and I said no, because I don't want to take one of the only roles for a deaf woman when there's a great deaf actress out there in the world, and she could have that role. And I think we need to take more responsibility for that. I understand when actors are like, we want to be able to suspend disbelief and I'll fight for the death. I think someone said for the right to be able to suspend disbelief. It's like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. But before you do that, can you please fight for the death for there to be more roles for disenfranchised people, for marginalised people? Let's fight for the death for the actual diversity first, for more gay roles that aren't just about being gay, for more disabled roles that aren't just about being disabled. Let's fight for, to the death for that. And then there'll be so many roles like that, then it'll be all right to share them with able-bodied straight white actors. Gotcha. But that's something that I feel very passionate about in Hollywood and I'm trying to not be a part of erasure. What's your dream project? My dream project is something with 
probably Kristen Wiig and Steve Carell, something like that. Comedy, I really mm. love comedy and it's something that I grew up watching and I'd love to do more of that. I'd also love to create my own comedy. And so I think that's something that I'll next go on to is starting to create my own content. How do you deal with rejection? Like when you write something and you think it's fire, and then you present it and they're like, nah, that's not what we're looking for. I just have high hopes, low expectations. And that's been my key to happiness. I'm always gonna, I see trying as winning and everything else on top of that is just cake. And so I think we need to put more emphasis on that so people actually try and live their dreams and don't like hold themselves back because they're so scared of failure. So you're living your dream right now? Yeah. Jamila, it was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> you are a winner. Thank you for joining me.